Welcome to Cup Chat with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Today, join our Birding with Extension team members and guest Rebecca Bracken as they discuss bird banding and migration. Hope you enjoy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cup Chat with Birding with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Um, joining me today is Rainy and special guest Rebecca Bracken, um, the research conservation research director from the Gulf Coast Bird Absor observatory and if everyone wants to know how hard observatory is to say with all the other words plus at 7 30 <laughs> in the morning it's challenging so um rebecca why don't you tell us and um, this is your second time on cup chat um so welcome back um before we kind of dive into some questions for you why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, maybe your birding journey and um sure. rainy at the end of that, it's going to ask you a question, our question for 2024 that we're going to ask every guest. Rainy's oh. going to come with up on the spot today and we'll ask <laughs> you at the end of year about me. Uh, Rainy, make it a good one. We're going to use it all year. Yeah. That makes me nervous, whatever that is. But it makes me yeah. nervous too, Rebecca. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, like Emily said, my name's Rebecca Bracken. I'm the Conservation Research Director at GCBO in Lake Jackson, Texas. No, she um, didn't say observatory because she right. knew better too. <laughs> too early, cut it out. Um, but no, so I've been in this position um, since June. Uh, my predecessor was there for almost 20 years. Um, so it gives you an idea of how long um, we've been in operation and um, and uh, how long our research programs have been going. Um, but GCBO was established in the late 1990s, um, and we've been doing research programs ever since. Um, so a little bit about how I got here. Um, my birding journey has been a little um, what I call unorthodox compared to some people. A lot of people know either as a child or once they get into college that they want to work with birds. I did not. I had no interest. <laughs> I was pre-vet and undergrad. I think like a lot of people are who are interested in working with animals. Mm -hmm. um, and after I realized I didn't want to be a veterinarian anymore, I went back to school to get my master's degree and got handed a bird project. And that sort of started it all. Um, between that and taking a field ornithology class and being out assisting other grad students, that really set the stage for me. Um, and so after my master's, I went and traveled the country and a little bit around the world, working various bird jobs before going back to get my PhD. And I wrapped up my PhD uh, less than a year ago um, and then went straight into the position that I'm in now. Awesome. So our 2024, because this is the first cup chat of the new year, Question of the year that we will ask all of our guests is what, Rainy? Well, you kind of already <laughs> answered it. I did come up with, you know, how did you actually get into birds or birding? Mm -hmm. um, but oh, so she's going to have to come up with another one by the end. If you have any ideas to help Rainy, put them in the chat this yeah. morning. Well, okay. and I will say, I mean, my I, I got really into the bird work because of the people that I was working with. It was not my original interest, but seeing the excitement from other people when we were, you know, banding baby birds that we had taken out of a nest box or some rare bird got spotted on a field trip, that's what really sold me on it. So so now you're a full-blown birder though, right? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm, I call myself a researcher. I'm an ornithologist. We've had this discussion recently because I'm a casual birder. I don't normally go spend an entire day chasing one bird um, like a lot of my colleagues, but I will if it's the right bird. So you're a birder for work. Yes. Gotcha. <laughs> and Me casually too. otherwise. <laughs> Me too. Okay. So let's first, where is the Gulf Coast where is GCBO? We're going to start with go. using the acronym. Where yeah. are you located? Like where in the state of Texas could someone mm -hmm. find you? So we are south of Houston uh, in a smaller town called Lake Jackson. We're about 20 minutes or so from the coast south of Houston. And um, the way I tell people to get there is if you're in Houston, head literally directly south. <laughs> um, just towards the coast, not towards Galveston. That south because that would be more southeast just head straight south right um 
and we're based in Lake, Lake Jackson. Um, we're centered on some property that used to be owned by Dow Chemical. It's right along Buffalo Camp Bayou, um, which is really, really nice. We get a lot of water birds and shorebirds kind of coming in. But we're a wooded property now, and so we get a lot of songbirds, too. Gotcha. Sorry, wrong person there. <laughs> All right. Um. So when and why did the goal, GCBO, st everybody's laughing this morning. I hope everyone's laughing. Um, when did GCBO start banding birds and, and why did y'all really start? Because one thing that kind of got me was we were talking about um, in our fall virtual birding seminar, we were talking about Audubon's migration initiative. Yeah, mm -hmm. I butchered that title, but we, we all watched it and pretty charts. It was beautiful. Um, and the one thing I talked about was how much banding birds contributed to that research pro to that project. That's and true. so um, I kind of we had some, a lot of questions about what banding birds were and how you were involved and how you got involved. And so I came across this opportunity at the GCBO and you're going to share a little bit about the opportunity mm -hmm. later. But why did when did y'all start? Why did y'all start? So that's a little bit of a two part question. Um because it depends which part you were looking at here in terms of we started as a research program with our staff um, in about 2011, working actually with American Oyster Catchers, which is our flagship program. We've done it now for quite a long time, uh, comparatively, and received a lot, of, a lot of data from that. But we also started a program back in 2006 at our headquarters in Lake Jackson, that's uh, run by two of our volunteers who are amazing bird banders um, that have been banding now for, for quite a while. Um, and then we assist them with that. So in short, we, we ban birds for research. There's always a purpose when we, when we band a bird. We don't just go catch a bird for fun to put a band on it because it is stressful to the bird. And everything that we do is about the health and safety and the welfare of the bird. Um, so for our research programs that, that we started in 2011 um, with Sue Heath, my predecessor, I started with American Oyster Catchers. And part of what we, we did when we started this program, it, it's to learn about these species that we don't necessarily know a whole lot about. So with American Oyster Catchers, like a lot of shorebirds, they're in decline or thought to be in decline. Um, and we know they are now through banding efforts and aerial surveys and winter counts and breeding counts and, and a variety of other methods. And so we started this program in collaboration with the American Oyster Catcher Working Group, which is researchers from all over the country that are studying American Oyster Catchers. And we all go out during the breeding season. We catch some of the adults. We put bands on them as well as color bands so that um, we can see them from a distance and uniquely identify them as well as we go out and we do nest monitoring and then we ban the chicks. Um, so we've learned a lot through that program. Um, we've learned a lot about um, um, which individuals are meeting with each other, how old these individuals are, some of their foraging sites, um, where are they going, um, you know, otherwise for daily movements, where are they nesting, what's, what is their annual productivity, what is their return rate, um, so how many of our chicks come back to actually breed in the area where they're originally banded um, and so on and so on. I mean, we could just, we could talk about it forever. <laughs> now, is that a high percentage of birds that come back? Like, I think that's interesting. Do, do you have a lot of yeah. return customers? We Well, so for adults, we do. Yes. Um, so adults are very site faithful. So they return to the same general area year after year. Um, the interesting thing for me is, is there is quite a bit of turnover um, within the pairs. So pairs are, are, are mated for the year and normally the same pair will come back year after year, but every once in a while it'll be a different female or suddenly a male will disappear and a younger male will come in. Um, and we don't always know what happened, um, but some of our males are on their third or fourth female, um, but the males stay in the same general area. Gotcha. Well, how unconventional of them, but we guess we'll take it. So, all right, Rainy, you got one? Yeah. So um, you've kind of already talked a little bit about the tools that you use. Um, so what methods do y'all use to catch these birds? And also once you catch them, you've already kind of mentioned it, but again, once they're caught, what happens as far as the whole process? Yeah. Um. So for catching, it really depends on what species you're targeting. There's 
probably an unnumbered amount of, of catching methods because someone's always inventing something new um, for catching birds. But a couple of the standard ones we use are things like mist nets, um, which I describe to people as very fine fishing netting. It's actually, it's more of like sewing thread, but it's, it's very fine mesh and you string it up between two poles vertically and birds, the way birds vision is it's so fine that they don't see the mesh. They see through it. And so they'll fly in and they fall into what we call a pocket. It's just some extra material and they get caught completely unharmed and they just sit there and wait for us to come get them. With shorebirds, it's a little bit different. Um, you can't normally put up a net really quickly on the coast and, and they're not going to fly into it. <laughs> uh, so we use a couple of different things. Um, one of the more common methods we use is called a noose carpet, which sounds really bad in some ways. You know, you think about sounds it. Rough. It sounds rough, but it's not. It's it's very similar uh, material. It's it's like fishing line, again, or, or sewing thread, um, but a little bit thicker. And it essentially just makes a carpet of these little nooses, these little circles. And so the bird will actually walk over it, and it just catches on their foot and prevents them from going anywhere. It's very gentle. Again, it doesn't hurt the bird in any way, um, but it... it it's easier to catch them that way than than with a mist net or some of the other methods. And the you use that? Oh, oh, God. <laughs> like, do you use that for the chicks, too? All I can see is the nope. cute fur babies. <laughs> no. Fluff um, balls. Not so fur for, babies, yeah. fluff, fluff balls. Feather fluff poopers. Balls. Yeah. For American oyster catcher chicks, they actually just generally run and hide. Um, so they think that they blend into the ground. And so they <laughs> will just go try to hide uh, under a bush. And so if, if as you're coming up, we come up with a boat because um, our, our birds nest on islands. And so we come up with the boat and normally we see where they're running to and they'll just go under a bush and drop. And you can walk right up to them. They have no awareness. They think, again, that you can't see them, that they're camouflaged. And you just pick them up. And that's the, the way it is for a lot of shorebirds. Yeah. Huh. So very simple to catch those little guys. Yes. <laughs> Not always, but most of the time. <laughs> that's awesome. So you talked a little bit about how this all goes from research, um, goes and helps research. But so one thing that got me interested, and you kind of corrected me before we came on, was with this bird migration initiative that Audubon talked about in our fall virtual, fall virtual seminar, they talked about getting involved in bird banding and, and supporting that research method. Because mm -hmm. um, we all know that citizen science using eBirds and things like that was great. Mm -hmm. But one thing specifically was bird banding um, for that project. So tell me, is it, are there opportunities for people to be involved and support GCBO's bird banding projects um, mm -hmm. as a volunteer, as something? Yes. So definitely, yes. Um, there are a number of different ways to get involved, but I, I do want to stress um, for anybody who's <clears throat> interested in volunteering that bird banding takes a federal permit. Um, we are trained to the point where the federal government is run by the USGS, so US Geological Survey. Um, we are trained to a point that they believe we can safely and appropriately handle all of the animals that we are trying to catch for research purposes. Again, we don't necessarily just do this for fun, though it is fun and we love it, um, but we have to have a reason for the work that we're doing. And so for us, there are some opportunities to join us. Uh, we host on the third Saturday of every month an open to the public bird banding opportunity at our headquarters in Lake Jackson. We have our volunteer banders that do the banding and our staff will assist um, with getting the birds out of the mist net um, and then anything else that the banders need. So we don't allow people without experience to come join and take a bird out of the net but we try to get people the opportunity to hold a bird, to feel a bird, to really see what that is like. And once you start having some experience, which you get by volunteering, so the more times you come and you show interest and then eventually go through a training session, either with us or someone else, um, they're offered generally around the country, we as well as other groups can start working you in and getting you more training and more experience to the point where you're comfortable handling birds and extract we call it extracting birds from a mist net and then bird banding eventually um so we do that quite a bit we also um we just wrapped it up we had what we call a big experience auction 
So we do a big fundraiser for us. We auction off the chance to come with us on the boat, for instance. And so you can come on a day where we're going to be banding oyster catchers, either adults or chicks. And so we will do all the banding because, again, we're the ones with the permits. Um, but you'll get to see the entire process and you'll get to hold either the adult or chick either um, during the banding process or as we're finishing up. Um, so you'll get to see it firsthand. You'll get to do it, you know, see it being done right in front of you and see the entire process. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to take Facebook poll. And if y'all don't vote in my favor, I may <laughs> not do another cup chat. But I think that we need Rebecca to come on one more time and do cup chat live from the boat. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Would that not be so fun? Oh my gosh. So it would be a lot of fun. Yeah. We don't normally go out until 7 30 though. So uh, we'd, have to, we'd have to do a special session down the road a little bit oh, later in the day. Don't worry. We would postpone because no one thinks 7 30 in the morning is a great thing, except for maybe people who watch uh, at 7 30 because nobody on the extension staff. Love 7.30 cup chats, <laughs> except for the fact that we all start our day much earlier on Wednesdays. Oh, I already have a vote on Facebook. Thank you, Katie, for, for <laughs> voting with me that we should do cup chat live from the boat. That would be so fun. It would be I fun. Just, yeah. <laughs> I, just think a little, I mean, we could go live video and see them squatting and dumb and you go pick them up. So anyways. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're pretty cute. Um, we we enjoy it quite a bit, and you know we, we love everything that we do. But bird banding is is always quite an experience. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And so Rainy, I think you asked earlier about some of the tools and the methods and everything that we do. I, I didn't want to circle back to that really quickly. Um, so once we catch a bird, um, we put a band on its leg. <laughs> In other countries, they call it a ring or ringing instead of banding. Um, and this band has a unique number to that bird. It's nine digits. No other bird will have that number. So I call it like the bird's social security number, basically. It uniquely identifies the bird. Um, that bird will wear it for its life. It's completely harmless. It does not hurt the bird in any way. There's been a lot of research on that. It won't affect um, mate attractiveness or anything like that as well. And then for our birds, like the oyster catchers, we actually put on color bands as well. So like I mentioned, you, we can be on a boat and use our binoculars or a camera and see that color band, which will have either three numbers or three letters or some combination of that, that will tell us who that bird is without having to get the bird in the hand again. Um, so once we do the banding, it's very hands-off monitoring. Um, How big are the numbers? My, you know, I'm I'm a lifestyle <laughs> gal. Yeah. My mother complains if I put too many numbers on an ear tag. Well, let me share a screen really quickly. Show you a variety yeah. of the color bands here. Hopefully, this will come up. It says it's loading at the moment. Yeah, we can um, see you. Perfect. So, color bands for birds come in a variety of different sizes. Most of the times, they go on the leg. Um, but for some birds, like swans or some of the geese, they actually go on the neck. Um, because if you think about those birds, they're sitting in the water, so you don't see their legs the vast majority <laughs> of the time. So we Good have point. to make the band more visible. Um, so our small bands, and I wish I brought some to actually hold them, but our small bands are teeny tiny. Ones for oyster catchers are about this big, um, going around the leg. And then once you get into something like an eagle or a whooping crane or a sandhill crane, I mean, those bands are are quite large. Gotcha. <laughs> going around. So... As long as there's contrast between the color and the, the numbers and letters, generally we can see it. Um, we do try to take a picture of every bird that we see that is banded. Um, once we make sure we read the band, the color band appropriately, we didn't miss something. Um, but two, that gives us documentation. So we know exactly who that bird was and where they were sighted. We'll take a GPS coordinate um, and then we keep track of our birds that way. I say our birds, like we own them. We don't own these birds. <laughs> free, free and wild birds, um, but we certainly feel protective of them. Well, I, I understand sometimes we take a little possession of stuff. So um, that's neat. Um, well, oh, I had a good question for you. Dang it, Rainy, you're gonna have to go walk and <laughs> drum it back up in my brain. All right, so, um, you know, you've kind of mentioned that it all goes into a data bank. What is some of the unique data that you've found interesting thus far from, from this experience? Oh, 
okay. Um, that's a good question. So, yeah, so all of this data um, gets stored within our system, but it also gets stored within the Berg Banding Lab and run by the USGS. Um, we're somewhere around, I believe it's 80 million birds that have been banded now um, that are stored in that database. So it's a very, very, very large number. Um, I think there were about 72 in 2016. So we should be close to 80 now. Um, so for me personally, I our, our oyster catcher program is, is quite special. I mean, again, that is our flagship program, but working with these birds, they really grow on you when you start working with them. And, and just like a lot of birds, you learn that each one has their own personality. Um, so again, we, we can track our birds based on those color bands. We know where they are. And so we can actually do behavioral observations as well um, when we're out there looking at them. And so to me, that's really, really interesting. But it's also really cool when, you know, we're working at our office and we're doing that open to the public monthly bird banding and we get a bird that we banded. Um, and I say we in the loosest sense of the word, I was not there as long ago, but, you know, we get a bird that we banded eight, 10 years ago that came back during migration to the exact same property. So the fact that it survived this long going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then it still comes and uses our office site as a stopover during that migration period, year after year. It, it's really, really cool to see. And it tells us a lot about those birds. That is neat. Um, so like what happens if, so, I've got, I've got two questions. I've, I've okay. got, they've, they've rolled up there. So one, if someone sees a banded bird when they're not there, when, when, when they're not there with y'all as a research mm -hmm. team, are there policies and procedures that our birders should be following? I mean, I don't think I've ever, other than when I saw the band go on the bird at um, when we did a bird banding thing, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen a bird with a band. <laughs> so yep. if someone was lucky enough to see a bird mm -hmm. with a band in its native world while they were just out on their casual birding stroll what do they do yes um so that federal uh, band again with that nine digit number on it it's going to be very hard for someone to read without getting a really good picture of that bird or unfortunately, if it's something like a window strike, you know, if the bird is actually in the hand, mm -hmm. um, you can read it. Um, but we do receive a lot of photographs of people, you know, they see a bird at their feeder that's banded and they take a bunch of photos and they can piece together that band number. And so what people need to do is go to reportband.gov. Okay, and I'll put that you in the comments. This, it'll take you to this website. I've got it up on the screen right now. Reportband.gov. Um, and it will help you report that band. So ideally, you need to know what species that bird was. Um, but if you get the band number and you don't know the species, that's okay. The band number will tell us what species it is. Because again, it's uniquely identifying that bird. Um so this will walk through um, all the different steps that someone needs to take um, to report the band. Um, you know, it talks about, who, you know, you put in your contact information, where you cited the bird. Um, did it have any color bands on it? Were there any issues with the bird, et cetera? And then the really cool thing is once you're done, I'm going to share my, a different image here. You get this really fun certificate of Hi. appreciation. Uh, and that'll be awarded to you with the information about the bird that you recited, that you found with the band. So it'll have that band number. It'll have when it was banded. It'll have the sex if it's known. It'll have the species. It'll have the age. And then it'll tell you where that bird was originally banded and who it was banded by. Um, so it gives you a bunch of inf different information. The other cool thing with this is because it does give you a name of the bander, you can reach out to that bander if you'd like additional information. For us, because people know that we do oyster catchers, we study oyster catchers, and we study Wilson's plovers and, and a variety of other species, people just email us <laughs> <laughs> um, and say, hey, you know, here's a photo of a bird. Um, and here's an oyster catcher that I saw up in Moses Lake, and it has a color band on it you know, can you send me the information about where it was originally banded? And we're very happy to do that. Oh, um, and that will go into not only the USGS banding lab database, it'll go into the American Oyster Catcher Working Group database, which compiles all of the oyster catcher data. 
Um, so you really are when you when you see a banded bird, you're contributing directly to research. That's super neat. Super neat. Now I forgot my other question. I had I had two. Dang it. <laughs> They're poofing this morning. They're poofing. <laughs> I like the way to say observatory. All right, Rainy, you got one? Um I guess so you talked about, you know, the this uh specific species initiatives that y'all have or the kind of flagship programs that y'all have. Has there been anything like this completely oddball bird that you would never have expected to catch that you've caught? Um it's a really good question. Um I don't know if we've had any true oddballs um in terms of a bird that, you know, is like from Asia or something that that we've had. Um, we've certainly had birds that are more uncommon. Um, we, we do hummingbird banding as well, um, which takes on in some ways a whole separate permit and training. Um, it, it takes a lot of work, um, something I'm working on right now. Um, and we've had um, a variety of hummingbird species that are not normally found in the Houston area um, during the winter. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, so actually one of the first hummingbirds that I banded Initially, just when it was coming to a feeder, we thought it was a rufous hummingbird, but it turned out to be an alum's hummingbird, um, which is thought to be less common. So that was a pretty cool experience for me, um, looking at this this tiny little bird and again thinking, wow, he came from so far away <laughs> um, to come spend the winter somewhere with us. Or maybe not. Maybe he went further south. It's hard to know sometimes unless they're caught again. Um, but yeah, we've we've had a variety of birds on migration. Um you know, some of the less common species, some of the warblers. Um, as far as shorebirds, most of the time we we get the species for banding purposes. You know, we're we're, we're targeting individuals. Um, so we're only targeting birds that we are specifically working with. So on those volunteer weekends, do y'all mm -hmm. y'all do mist nets and some shorebirds or kind of give us what a what yeah. a layout? Like, what would someone expect to do if they, or not do, but see if they came down on yeah. the open banding weekend? So it, it depends on the time of the year. Um, it is just mainly for songbirds. So we are okay. just mist netting. Um, however, in the fall, we also do hummingbird banding. Okay. Um, so we'll put up a couple of hummingbird feeders with, and they actually have traps that go around the hummingbird feeder. Um, so the hummingbird will fly in to, to feed at the feeder and then they just can't get out, but they're still free flying. Um, so again, completely harmless for them. Um, we do that generally in the month of September. We have a big hummingbird festival. We have two weekends called Hummingbird Extravaganza um, or Extreme Extravaganza, I think is what it's called. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been a while. This is early in the morning. Um, but it's it's two Saturdays in September where we'll do hummingbird banding on, on top of any songbird banding um, that is needed at that time. Um, so when somebody comes into our monthly songbird banding, um, the the gate opens at eight. It's generally when we start. We run eight to noon-ish, depending on the weather and the time of the year. Um, when it gets really hot over the summer, we often cut it a little bit short. Um, but we will have nets in a variety of different locations around our property. So we're catching mostly songbirds, but we have caught hawks before. Oh, wow. Um, we've caught kingfishers. Um, and then one of my favorites that I'm super jealous about that I was not there for, we did catch black-bellied whistling ducks. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, so you can catch a variety of birds in the mist nets that you're not necessarily intending to catch. Um, but it can hold for some of those larger birds as well. Um, so when someone comes in again at eight o'clock or nine o'clock, you know, whatever time you feel like uh, getting up and coming in, um, you just drive in, you park. Um, we're under a big pavilion. You can't miss us. And we will have coffee available. Normally we have donuts as well. Um, we pick up some Shipley's donuts, which are my favorite, um, or my boss likes Julia's donuts. Um, <laughs> out of our area. So we always provide those. Um, and we have a bunch of chairs set up. Again, it, it's covered. Um, so you don't have to worry as much about sunscreen and sun exposure. Uh, and our banders will be banding while we'll be taking the birds out of the mist net. And you'll get to see it up close. And they'll talk about what they're doing and what the species is and is it male and female. And um, particularly during migration, we talk a lot about their fat stores. So birds that are migrating need to bulk up on their fat. 
um, for those long flights. So we always check and see how much fat those birds have. Um, you can see it, their skin is very thin. So you can see it underneath the skin. Uh, and then they can potentially hold a bird for release at the end of it. Wow. So well, that's exciting. That's cool. Now, let me ask you this. Well, I'm just gonna make a point now. Um, so one thing that I really enjoyed when we had the opportunity to bird be involved in bird banding mm -hmm. with a birding with extension program um, with Texas Tech University mm -hmm. was the opportunity to see some of those field markings really mm -hmm. up close. Right. Um, and so one thing like, you know, getting hands on a bird is one thing, but mm -hmm. if you are into increasing your knowledge and, mm -hmm. and having that up close experience with seeing that bird, um, I think bird banding and going to your open weekends would be a great way to kind of really take that next level. And then you combine that. Um, sorry, we're just going to go all back on fall on uh, for virtual birding seminars. You combine that with improving your identification skills by mm -hmm. sketching that bird um, mm -hmm. and doing some field sketches. Um, obviously, I don't show any of my field sketches because they're very <laughs> atrocious, but remembering those field markings in that up close experience and straight to the paper can really help develop your identification skills in your in your memory of that bird mm -hmm. um, in such a different way. Um, and so I think that's a, a really unique thing about being a part of a bird banding experience, whether you are getting to do the whole enchilada or just get to sit there and watch. And um, we were lucky, and I'm sure your volunteers do the same thing. You, they really probably show those field marks and show why we know what mm -hmm. bird this is. Um, and especially for beginner birders, getting involved in such a, you know, it's a high level bird, birding activity that we think is very advanced, but it really can be beneficial for beginner birders to take that education of theirs to the next level. So I, it's such a unique experience that I got to have. Um, I think we did that at Learn to Bird one year and it was it, very unique. So, um, oh, we no, we did it at Birding the Hill Country. That's what we did. Um, and we did it out at the Texas Tech um, Center in Junction. So anyways, we, it's a little after eight o'clock. So we know everybody has to get to the office. Um, Rainy, have you thought of the 2024 question of the year? <laughs> um, well... Um, I know that you said that you were just kind of a casual birder, but in your casual birding ex experiences, mm -hmm. has there been a favorite location that you just love to go to? Oh, this is a good one. There is. Um, so I love the Port Aransas area. There's, um, it's a water treatment facility called the Leona Bell Turnbull Birding Center. <laughs> um, it's kind of behind a water treatment facility. That has always been one of my favorite spots during migration. Um, and there's there's some really good spots during migration in Texas, as I'm sure every, everyone knows. Um, High Island up by Anahuac is is one of the big places. Um, we have some property on the, co on the coast as well called Quintana. It's also a great site. It's really second to High Island. But I love being down in Port Aransas and at there and at Charlie's Pasture, um, which gets a lot of shorebirds. Um, it's been one of my my favorite go-to sites. <laughs> we will let you win that one. I thought that was a good one, Rainy. <laughs> Great way to start off 2024 was everyone will get to tell us about their favorite birding spot. Ooh, I love it. Um, so Rebecca, thank you for coming on again and sharing your bird banding knowledge um, and we hope that some of our uh, Birding with Extension family maybe gets the opportunity to come out um, on one of y'all's open weekends. That sounds like such a fun thing. If you ever want to do Cup Chat Live from the Oyster Boat, you just let <laughs> me know. I will come. We'll do it on the Facebook, like on the, on the, we'll get a selfie stick and everything. Like we'll be as high tech as you can be high tech in a boat catching oysters on Zoom. So. <laughs> Anyway, sounds good. We'll keep it in mind. <laughs> just let me know. But thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a great morning. We hope everyone has a productive week and we will see you soon. Um, and don't forget Burning the Border registration is open. Uh, we have two new sites. One uh, has not been released yet. And I know you're like, well, if it's open, how have you not released your site? Well, we have just gotten very official, very secret approval for. Um, so we have to open that and release that to those individuals who have already registered um, if they would like to change their trip 
Um, but then it will become open live on the public website. So just so you know, it's coming soon. Um, and then the second is we had the opportunity to go scout the south unit of the Devil's River. Not open to the public yet. Um, we went and saw that over the Christmas holiday. Amazing unit location, completely different views, varying habitat from the north unit um, in which we already go to um, and get to see Dolan Falls. So that's exciting. So con little same-ish kind of birds, but we've got some different habitat locations and we've got some unique things at both sites. So uh, be one of the first birders to bird publicly on or to bird at the south unit with us. Um, first trip ever for birding with extension. Um, and then our second top secret, I think it is a good top secret location is coming soon. Um, just got real fancy approval. So excited to share that as soon as, uh, as, as soon as we can. So thank you, Rebecca. Have a great morning, everyone. Um, and we'll talk to y'all soon.